So by way of background, on September 15th, the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board released a discussion paper on this topic. The purpose of their, of their paper was to get input from stakeholders on these topics as it relates to the role of the auditor in an audit of financial statements and whether the IAASB standards remain fit for purpose. The deadline for comments for this discussion paper was February 1st, 2021, and the Canadian Auditing and Assurance Standards Board issued their response after considering the feedback received from their consultations and outreach. Our outreach we conducted was two part. Part one focused on having targeted consultations with individual stakeholder groups in isolation, such as practitioners, management, audit committees, regulators, and users to get their detailed feedback on these issues. We held close to 15 targeted outreach sessions ranging from individual interviews with members of the user community through to small group sessions with practitioners, regulators, and those charged with governance. The second piece of our outreach plan was a larger multi-stakeholder outreach that we hosted in November. The preparation for this session was leveraging the individual stakeholder input that we received through our part one conversations with stakeholders on these key issues. We used the multi-stakeholder format to ensure that we were getting a more holistic perspective rather than the views of any one group in isolation. And as I mentioned earlier, the input from the outreach was used by the AASB in informing their views and responding to that discussion paper. The concept of the expectation gap is one that has been discussed at length over years. The IAASB broke down that gap into three components. The knowledge gap being the difference between what the public thinks the auditors do and what auditors actually do. The performance gap being a lack of application of the standards and regulations by practitioners. And finally, the evolution gap, which is what they perceive to be left over once you carve out the other two gaps. And this is really where the profession may need to evolve. We asked our stakeholders which of these subcomponents, in their view, was the main cause or driver of the expectation gap. The views we heard were varied. Generally speaking, most were of the view that the knowledge gap was an underlying driver of the expectation gap. They acknowledged that there is a lack of understanding by financial statement users of the roles and responsibilities of each party within the financial reporting ecosystem, including the auditor. As it related to fraud, in addition to the knowledge gap, some stakeholders felt the performance gap was also a main driver. These stakeholders had the view that there are instances in which the auditor is not fulfilling the audit standard requirements or that the audit standards around fraud were not robust. It, it was interesting to note, however, that this was the view of all stakeholder groups other than the practitioners. And for the evolution gap, the majority of stakeholders felt that evolution in the auditor's responsibilities was needed in response to the ever-changing tools and techniques used by fraudsters. As it related to going concern, outside of the knowledge gap, stakeholders felt there was less need for the auditor's role to evolve than there was in, in the case of fraud. They emphasized that it's important not to ignore the role of other parties, particularly management who holds responsibility for completing the going concern assessment. Overall, when we take a step back and reflect on the views that were shared, while the views may have varied, there was one underlying theme, underlying theme from all of the discussions. It was really that the few things that the stakeholders could all agree on, which was that in order for the expectation gap to be narrowed, collective action is needed from all parties in the financial rep reporting ecosystem, and it can't just be the auditor. So in the IAASB's discussion paper, um, they provide or discuss some possible enhancements that could help to address the expectation gap as it relates to fraud. And so we'll talk about five of those enhancements. The first one being increased use of forensic specialists or other specialists in the audit. So the suggestion here is that requiring the use of forensic specialists in the audit more broadly uh, will help will help to strengthen the audit procedures uh, that are conducted in respect to fraud. And so in our outreach, um, stakeholders felt uh, supported this option, but in part. Practitioners agree that involving forensic specialists um, will enhance or could enhance the audit 
procedures, but uh, especially since they do struggle sometimes in order to address fraud risks of what procedures may be appropriate. Um, however, practitioners cautioned um, that involving forensic specialists in every audit may not be appropriate. They like the flexibility that's provided in the extent standard, uh, where this decision is left to the practitioner's professional judgment, and uh, rather than being mandated, and they feel that that continues to be appropriate. Um, they also raise scalability concerns with this option, um, since there are a limited number of forensic specialists uh, available, that uh, getting them involved could become an issue. Um, and then the costs, it, it can be a high cost to involve these uh, specialists, and especially on smaller engagements, um, that it may be difficult to rationalize this additional cost. Also, they felt, uh, practitioners felt that if forensic specialists are involved, that this may actually increase the expectation gap. They believe that, um, you know, um, users may believe that a forensic audit was conducted when it's not. Regulators were the only um, stakeholder group that supported involving forensic specialists more. Um, they believe that there's a number of specialists that are involved in the audit currently. And so this is an added area where uh, expertise should be utilized. Another enhancement uh, discussed in the paper is additional focus on non-material fraud. So currently the fraud standard ISA 240 requires the audit, auditor to evaluate each identified misstatement for whether it's indicative of fraud. Um, so questions have been raised as to whether the auditor needs to do more in relation to or identifying non-material frauds. And here in our outreach, stakeholders did not support this option. Um, they reinforced that preventing, detecting, and investigating fraud really is the responsibility of the entity. Uh, the extent uh, requirement for the auditor to evaluate all misstatements for any indication of fraud that they continue to be appropriate. Uh, stakeholders also recognize that it would be inappropriate to expect the auditor to conduct audit procedures to identify non-material fraud, since this does not align with the objective of the audit. The third enhancement discussed in the paper is increasing the auditor's responsibilities with respect to third-party fraud. So the definition of fraud in ISA 240 includes intentional acts that may be conducted by third parties, but the discussion paper asks whether the auditor should be required to conduct additional audit procedures in order to identify third party frauds. So stakeholders, once again, did not support the, exploring this option further. Um, practitioners believe that the requirements of the extant standard adequately consider risks of third-party fraud as part of the risk assessment and the fraud assessment process. Um, those charged with governance uh, were the only stakeholder group that uh, supported exploring this um, exploring this further. They believe that uh, there is an increased risk of third party fraud, especially due to the business environment right now, um, due to COVID and the increased use of technology. Um, so therefore additional focus by the auditor on this risk area should be required. The fourth enhancement uh, was enhancing quality control requirements. So right now, specific quality control review procedures related to fraud are not explicitly required. But in some jurisdictions like Japan, they have implemented additional quality control uh, review procedures related to fraud. And um, so here in our outreach, we heard the stakeholders felt that additional research is needed um, and really to understand whether this option would result in uh, the desired uh, changes in behavior. Um, practitioners were cautious to add another checklist type of procedure um, 
And so evidence is really needed to demonstrate that there would be a positive impact on the auditor's ability to identify or address fraud risks in the audit. Practitioners recognize that enhancements in this area would be or could be easier to um, implement um, because there, the process exists right now uh, rather than trying to create a new process. Regulators were also supportive of this option um, since the framework already exists and the procedures could be targeted based on the fraud risk profile of the entity. And lastly, um, the enhancement of whether the auditor should have a suspicious mindset uh, when conducting the audit. The discussion paper recognizes that merely asking the auditor to be more skeptical um, will not drive the behavior change that's needed. Um, and so, hence, should the auditor really be having more of a suspicious mindset when they're conducting the audit? Um, for this enhancement, we really heard no support. Um, stakeholders struggle to understand, you know, what is meant by suspicious mindset and what that would entail. Uh, there was concerns that having this suspicious mindset would mean a greater burden of proof in trying to collect audit evidence um, or lead to onerous information demands um, for entities. And really the suspicious mindset um, could lead to an adversarial relationship between auditors and clients and uh, you know, would not be conducive um, to a healthy relationship. Stakeholders supported um, the concept of professional skepticism, um, but they understand that practitioners sometimes struggle with how to apply this, so they felt that greater guidance or educating auditors on how to implement professional skepticism better would be better warranted. During our outreach, we also heard feedback about ISA 240, um, and uh, there were some concerns raised regarding several of the sections or requirements within the standard. The first one really being the rebuttable presumption related to uh, fraud risks over revenue. Um, practitioners questioned whether this presumption continues to be appropriate. Uh, some practitioners believe that undue time is spent on this when it's not always relevant to the nature of, of the business or given the nature of the entity. And on the other hand, regulators were concerned that auditors are rebutting this presumption too often, that in 25% of you know, audits, it is rebutted. And they felt that this was um, a little high. The second one was the unpredictability of audit procedures. So regulators express concerns that auditors tend to perform the same audit procedures year over year and that that loses its unpredictability. On the other hand, um, practitioners were concerned that if the standard um, provided a list of procedures that that would negate, um, you know, the unpredictability of, of the procedures. So there really does need to be a fine balance. Third was around the nature and extent of journal entry testing. So feedback from stakeholders suggested that some auditors um, don't understand the purpose of journal entry testing and how it fits into the overall approach for identifying and addressing fraud risks. So stakeholders also believe that the standard could be updated to recognize the uh, use of audit analytics and how that uh, fits into journal entry testing. And lastly, uh, the appendices that are in ISA 240, stakeholders felt that they could be updated to uh, better reflect current business practices. So uh, on the discussion paper, uh, the uh, it pr provided a uh, discussion of three areas for further discussions uh, with respect to going concern. Uh, the first one being uh, the time period for going concern uh, really deals with whether the uh, International Audit Insurance Standards Board should work with the International Accounting Standards Board and other uh, accounting standards setters 
uh, to determine whether uh, the going concern assessment should be extended beyond uh, a normal practice of 12 months. Uh, the second uh, area of exploration was uh, other concepts of resiliency. So taking a more holistic uh, view of an entity's ability to adapt to adverse circumstances, uh, as opposed to a, a mere pure determination of whether it could survive. And the third area was just really looking uh, uh, in, uh, at the term material uncertainty relating to going concern. What does the term mean? Uh, and so with the first one, uh, extended the time period for going concern assessments, uh, the, uh, the discussion paper sort of talks about how most accounting frameworks uh, require going concern assessment based on the business uh, cycle. Uh, and 12 months is, is, is a period that's most frequently used because it's often tied to things like funding cycles, re reporting cycles, like uh, I guess Laurentia University's uh, funding uh, normally done on a 12 month basis. Uh, so it sort of asked the question as to whether uh, the uh, audit insurance standards board should work with the accounting standard setters to explore whether to extend the time period for assessing going concern. And the thinking is that management still has to go first. The accounting standards will require management to perform an assessment over a longer period of time. And the auditor would then evaluate uh, this longer uh, uh, management assessment. And what we have heard for this one is that there's very little support uh, for this, uh, for further exploring this area. Uh, key reason being that it's hard enough to assess going concern for the next 12 months, extending the time period would make most uh, assessments extremely unreliable. And I mean, if we look back 12 months ago today, I would say virtually all going concern assessment done 12 months ago, uh, 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 ago uh, really would not have reflected what actually happened in the course of this uh, 12 months. The second item on the uh, uh, other concepts of resiliency, uh, the uh, discussion paper itself looked into other jurisdictions around the world uh, that has some studies of initiatives on looking at the company's resiliency. So for example, in the UK, uh, in addition to just the normal short-term going concern assessment, uh, certain listed entities are also required to disclose longer-term resiliency. So things such as uh, results of stress testing, the company under various scenarios, et cetera. And what we have heard from uh, stakeholders on this second aspect was, there is definite interest uh, in further exploration of uh, resiliency concepts. Uh, and we've also heard that the public sector uh, already has some guidance on looking at, uh, let's say, an entity's flexibility, sustainability, and vulnerability. Uh, uh, but having said that, uh, there is still also a lot of hesitancy in terms of uh, stakeholders voicing actual support for uh, any of the enhancements. Uh, really, stakeholders really just want to know more about how would such resiliency concepts look like, uh, what exactly would management be required to assess, uh, and how would auditors uh, audit such assessments. So this is, uh, I would say, some early stage aspiration, uh, but this is probably definitely an area that I think would be of interest to many stakeholders, uh, uh, including uh, regulators and, and such. The last uh, item uh, area in the discussion paper, material uncertainty related go to co going concern, uh, many stakeholders have identified problems with applying the existing accounting standard dealing with material uncertainty. Uh, so it really includes like given the same set of circumstances uh, that cast uh, doubts on the company's ability to continue as going concern, different people reach different conclusions as to what material uncertainty on going concern is triggered. And this inconsistent interpretation obviously have quite significant ramifications on disclosures in the financial statements as well as in the auditor's reports. And I think this concern is really consistent with the comments that we've heard just now about crying wolf. Uh, some people, when do we cry wolf? Is it uh, too early? Is it too late? And uh, there was actually some good suggestions from stakeholders uh, that included, so perhaps supplementing this material uncertainty on going concern disclosures 
with other disclosures, so sort of more of a disclosures of a spectrum of going concern risk that the entity is facing. Uh, so there were some suggestions on, on, on maybe perhaps how to address this. The last item I want to talk about uh, is something that's outside of the discussion paper, but there were other suggestions uh, uh, that we heard from stakeholders on how auditors could enhance the ability to identify and assess going concern risk under the current uh, uh, accounting as well as uh, uh, auditing standard uh, before things really go wrong. And so some of the suggestions on how to maybe better identify such indicators include uh, more in-depth understanding of the entity and its environment. Uh, so for example, maybe having more specific and accurate procedures at the risk assessment stage that uh, include specific going concern risk considerations, uh, more robust discussions uh, with management, those charge of governance. So rather than just simply asking, are you aware of any going concern risk? Uh, maybe questions such as what keeps you up at night? may prompt more thoughtful discussions. And lastly, uh, and another suggestion was uh, perhaps quality uh, control system at the firm level could be enhanced. So maybe uh, having policies and procedures to monitor news for potential going concern risks uh, that may impact the firm's client uh, uh, portfolio. So these are some of the suggestions that we have heard. This conversation is not over. It's just the beginning. We are at the information gathering stage of the project. So happy to hear your views.